Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. It means the world, not only to me, but I know it means the world to Melissa and all of the poets here. Um, I'm Meg Tyler. I'm an assistant professor of humanities here at Boston University. I'll describe to you how the evening is going to look. First, Professor Warren will come up on the stage to provide an all-purpose introduction to the occasion. Then, 15 poets, one at a time, will come up to the podium to read the poems they have contributed to a she for Melissa. Uh, and then, at the end of those 15 readings, Melissa will come up and read from her poetry. And afterwards, I hope we will all adjourn to the reception in the Gilbane Lounge, uh, to buy books, to have those books signed, to drink wine, and to be merry. So I welcome you all. Uh, but before we begin the readings, could I please just ask you to check your cell phones and make sure they are turned off. Thank you so much. This occasion is to celebrate Melissa Green. The Squanacook eclogues, when they appeared in 1987, startled the English language. In this sequence of four long poems, high compression married a high sensuousness in work that was at once a magnificat and a requiem. For instance, lines like these, the river's song reviving us with mercy in the water's tongue or wind lay cradled in the dogwood's arms, or yet our dead still write to us, and we are torn by what we read. The book was celebrated, but one cannot live in or on a state of celebration. There followed hard years for Melissa Green, the hardness of which can be gleaned from her Memoir, her beautiful memoir, Color is the Suffering of Light, which she published in 1995, a book that details ways in which our dead do still write to us. And harder years followed. Years have not daunted this matchless poet. Rather, we might say that hardness is the medium from which she has wrought the flashing, harsh, and tender voice in these new poems in the book 52, the book we celebrate this evening. It is the spirit of the true artist, the survivor, who writes these lines, setting out once again into the void from which art is made, tundra of the white page, steps of emptiness and ice, equipped with crampons and picks, I notch out a palm on nice, frost-bitten, winded, afraid to die. The poets who contributed to the sheaf for Melissa, some of whom gather here to read in her honor tonight, do so in camaraderie, in solidarity, and in tribute to a powerful member of our tribe. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Our first poet tonight is Sinan Antoun, who is, a, who is an Iraqi poet, novelist, and translator. He is also co-director and co-producer of a 2003 documentary about the lives of Iraqis in a post-Saddam-occupied Iraq. Thank you. It's a great honor to be tonight, here tonight. My poem is entitled, A Sign. He pours whiskey on time, makes a home sleep. One wall for his back. Yesterday's paper makes for a ceiling. Life is postponed for now. But the ghosts still roaming his past are always on time panting, every moment an open grave, a window to be shut. He quarrels with the void. He's mad, the passers-by think. 
He places an ear to the ground. More graves are being dug. Ghosts will wave from newspapers. He runs away, leaving the piece of cardboard on the ground. Gulf War veteran. Thank you. Frank Bedard, who teaches at Wellesley College, is the author of several books of poetry. His next, Watching the Spring Festival, is coming out in April. Quote, you who never lied, lied about what you at every moment carried, the shameful, new, incomprehensible disease which you whose religion was candor couldn't bear not to hide. Now that you have been dead 13 years, I again see you suddenly lay out my coat across your bed, caressing it as if touch could memorize it. No, you're flattening it, then smoothing its edges until under your hand, as I watch, it becomes hieratic an icon. What I seized on as promise was valediction. Lucy Brock Broido, who directs the poetry program at Columbia University, is working on a new book of poems. I'm the interloper here. I wasn't supposed to be in town, and then now I am. And I just uh, showed up. Uh, and I'd just like to say how glad I am to honor Melissa and her work, and also how glad I am that we're not going to be in this room for 16 hours tonight, because I called Frank Bedart to get directions last night, and he told me he would be reading for 50 minutes um, a really magnificent poem of his called The Third Hour of the Night, but that Robert Pinsky was only reading 40 minutes, but that Rosanna was uh, going to be reading a century of sonnets. <laughs> and I said, is that a hundred? Um, and I believed him. <laughs> and lastly, he told me that his broadside, that his 40-page poem fit on one broadside and that Oscold was going to hold a magnifying glass. And I believed that, and I'm full of shame. <laughs> a girl ago, no feeding on wisteria, no pitch burner traipsing in the thistled woods, no milk in metal cylinders, no buttering, no making small contusions on the page, but saying nothing no one has not said before. No milkweed blown across your pony coat, no burrs, no scent of juniper on your Jacobean mouth, no crush of ink or injury, no lacerating wish. Extinguish me from this. I was 16 for 20 years. By November, I will be a ghost and flickering in unison with the, all the other fireflies in Appalachia, blinking in the swarm of it. And all at once, above, on a bare branch in a shepherd's sky, no dove, there is no thou to speak of. Thank you.
Michael Collier's most recent book of poems is Dark Wild Realm. He is the director of the Breadloaf Writers Conference and teaches at the University of Maryland. I had this idea I would try and sprint, but the, the steps are tricky there. My father's knee. At 92, my father's knee is a harsh, dread spectacle betrayed by Bermuda's shorts. Girdled in elastic, the cap, collared like an eye, is blind to everything but motion's pain. And this it sees so clearly my father rarely moves, except to pee or shit or eat or sleep, and sometimes even these he can't negotiate. And yet, the short up knee is beautiful in its boundary stake refusal to yield to the arthritic foot that's ready for its shoe. William Corbett teaches writing at MIT. A pleasure to be <clears throat> reading with Melissa on an evening when poetry is, as it should be, a social art. I celebrate myself, Ed and Tamoyuki, in Grafton Street, going over waltz. I loaf. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease. You can lean one way, lean another, but there's no stance to loaf. Action of inaction, stretched out on the couch with a book. Unshaven, two days, one o'clock class, a memory. The soul, whatever you are, that is essential and unknowable, that weighs nothing, you ask in to go about its business of doing absolutely nothing and observe the blue between clouds in their infinite variety and depths of blue, like thoughts, if you had thoughts, but you aren't so inclined. You're loafing. A loafer, like your shoes, the black city ones stepped out of on the rug toward easeful remembering our conversation, but not how we specifically defined Walt's attitude of aimless looking for its own sake at one spear among many of summer grass. It was March then, now it's June. Tomoyuki's translation has appeared and the beautiful uncut hair of graves runs down the page in Japanese. Stuart Dishel is the author of four books of poems, most recently, Backwards Days. Hey, Melissa. Harmless poem. Forgive the web without its spider the house plant with few or many flowers, and the stars for hiding in the daytime. Forgive astronauts for distance and surgeons for proximity. Forgive the heart for the way it looks like something a dog eats from a pan. Forgive goat gods and wine gods and the goddess bathing in her pond. Forgive the sea for being moody the air for its turbulence, the stomach for its vomit. Forgive the insistence of sperm, the greeting of the ovum. Forgive orgasms for their intensity and the faces they make in people's faces. Forgive the music of liars 
forgive autumn and winter and the departure of lovers and the beautiful young dead and the persistence of the old. Forgive the last tooth and hair. David Ferry is a poet and translator now at work on a new collected poems and selected translations and on a translation of Virgil's Aeneid. Of this poem is called Walker Evans, The House. The old house is there for us to look at. Not there for us to look at. It is there. We look at it. It's blank, unsmiling front, says nothing more than what it has come down to. Not even that. It says what it is now. The eyes too complicated for what is in its sight. The house is simple. No color in a country of no color. It's like that with the people. We look at them. They are not there for us to look at, but they are there, unsmiling, blank, no color. George Caligeris teaches at Suffolk University, and is the author of a book of poems, Camus Carnet, based on the life of Albert Camus. The poem I'd like to read for my dear friend Melissa is my translation of a poem by the Italian poet Eugenio Montale and it's called Your Hand Was Touching the Keyboard. Tentatively, you touched the keyboard and paused, scanning intently as if you knew the score impossible to play. All the chords suddenly tense as a throat tightened by grief watching you stop the music, looking so lost before the language that was most your own. Tenderness seemed to spread across the room. One window was still half open, and there it was clear the crystalline waves were breaking, softly enough to mutter something just beyond the frame. Now the butterflies passed, but not before we saw them dance across the window's azure. A branch quivered, touched by the rays of the sun, but nothing around us came to light in words, and your gentle ignorance was mine was ours. Thank you. Because Seamus Heaney could not be here with us tonight, Melissa has asked me to read the poem he contributed to the sheaf. It is called The Baylor. The Baylor. All day, plunk of a baler ongoing, cardiac dull, so taken for granted, it was evening before I came to, to what I was hearing and missing, 
summer's richest hours as they had been to begin with. Fork lifted, sweated through, and nearly rewarded enough by the giddied up race of a tractor at the end of the day last lapping a hayfield. But what I also remembered as wood pigeons sued at the edge of 30 gleaned acres, and I stood inhaling the cool in a dusk El Dorado of mighty cylindrical bales, was Derek Hills saying the last time he sat at our table. He could bear no longer to watch the sun going down and asking please to be put with his back to the window. Gail Mazur's fifth book, Zeppo's First Wife, New and Selected Poems, won the Massachusetts Book Award and was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and the Patterson Society Prize. I'm so happy to be here celebrating Melissa Green's life in poetry and hearing, hearing it celebrated by new poems of all these wonderful poets. I'm going to read a poem called Concordance to a Life's Work. And it actually, I came across, oddly, a concordance to my life's work <laughs> on the web. And I was shocked at how ordinary all the language was. Then I consoled myself by thinking the most scrumptious words I wouldn't want to be using over and over again. And, and yet, I was, I was obviously partly the alliteration. I found them compelling and wanted to use them and sort them. Concordance to a life's work. Again, air. Always another answer, away. Bed, bedroom, bird. Black, blue. Body, book brain. Daughter, day, 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 dead. Door, down, dream, eyes, face, father. Final floor, friend. Girl, give good green grief. Hard head, heavy home hour. No late, Last, leave. Let life light, little, look long. Love matters, and maybe mind. Morning, mother. Mother movie, must buster myself. Need, new night, night, nothing. Old own pain. Pale past poems, purpose, questions. Right room, right room. Should somehow someone stay? Still street, students, table. Take tears, tell terror thing. Think thought. Tied time together, toward tree turn voice, want, wild with, without words, world. Years yet, again, air, always another answer, away, away. Jennifer Moxley, who lives and teaches in Maine, is the author of four volumes of poetry, the most recent of which is The Line from the Post-Apollo Press. Lost Solitary Meanings. The happiness that comes in striving weighs very little when placed beside the happiness 
birthed in stillness that occurs as if, the me as if the memory of an experience you couldn't possibly have had. It lacks particularity of incident, geography, friends, family, or photographic record. Wholly devoid of what the ancient philosophers scornfully called pleasure, this cavernous happiness lacks the sort of purpose most happinesses voiced upon you, such as the need for purchases, invitations, and feasts. No reaction to its presence is allowed lest it vanish. Sadness will always accompany it, and indeed may be its doppelganger. A sadness unlike the frustrated sadness that comes of petty failures and little setbacks. Unlike the horrendous sadness that acceptance loss demands. This stilled happiness wears convulsive sadness as a mask. It roots us to the spot where, aware of our total impotence when faced with a rich synaptic opiate superior to the thin surface of cheap joy produced by the best of our entertainments, it forces us to recognize with its concrete-like effects that this is a real feeling which we cannot own. Robert Pinsky's new book of poetry, just published, is Gulf Music. Shame. The Purgatory of Dante, Canto 30, lines 61 to 78. Shame. I turned at the sound of my own name to see that same veiled lady as at the festival of angels. She turned also and looked at me from across the water. Folds of cloth that fell from her encircling crown of Minerva's leaves concealed her face, but I heard her voice. Look well in the regal, even tone of one who saves her most heated words, for later she began. Be sure, I am Beatrice. Can you say what gives you courage or happiness? Or made you plan to climb the mountain? What has brought you here? I dropped my gaze to the water. But looking down, I saw my own reflection, clear in that clear mirror, and I flinched and looked away again. Lloyd Schwartz is Frederick S. Troy Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and editor of the forthcoming Library of America edition of Elizabeth Bishop's Collected Works. Uh, my contribution to the sheaf for uh, Melissa uh, is what I think is the world's shortest sestina in six different languages. And I will read it in only one language tonight. Six words. Yes, no, maybe. Sometimes, always, never. Never? Yes. Always? No. Sometimes? Maybe. Maybe never sometimes. Yes. No always. Always maybe. No. Never yes. Sometimes, sometimes, always, yes, maybe, never, no, no, sometimes, never, always, maybe, yes, yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, never.
Tom Slay's most recent book of poetry is Spacewalk, published by Houghton Mifflin. He teaches in the MFA program at Hunter College. Uh, W.B. Yeats has these famous lines that go, um, think where man's glory most begins and ends, and say that my glory was I had such friends. And that's how I feel, but it also has a corollary. Uh, think where man's glory most begins and ends, and say that my trouble was I had such friends. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, this poem <coughs> for Melissa, it's called Claw. As my friend gets sicker from his cancer, he sees the claw growing big as his own body, the giant serrated curve of it clicking automatically. He tells me not to tell him how others have survived. It's so hard for people to listen, to not try speaking past him to the claw of their own need. He tries to look at it with almost bemused detachment. No question but that he has to lift it, but why? Why does it have to take up his whole mind? Why should he dig with it, hunt with it, think only of what it needs? He looks up at the ceiling and studies it aloft and the shadows hovering. Modeled white and blue, it looks almost infantile, as if it needed his protection to be cradled, stroked, made to feel it's all okay. It takes so much of him, from him, to make the claw leave him alone. At a dim angle to his upturned face, the claw moves in and out of view. But when he turns to me, the claw sweeps down between our bodies. It seems fragile, wistful. It taps his shoulder gently. It whispers, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Don't ever leave me. And then it taps my shoulder, too. Scrape of bone, not quite chill. Friendly, almost. Only don't, don't try to come between us. Winner of the 1992 Nobel Prize for Literature, Derek Walcott teaches at Boston University, and his selected poems came out from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux this year. I was debating with myself down there whether I should say this, um, but another year has come to an end, and I'm going back to St. Lucia. What I'm going to narrate is a very personal thing that happened. <clears throat> when Melissa's father died, she was in my class, and uh, she said, you know, she can't handle it. And I said, yeah, you have, to, you have to write a poem. So she was staggered, write a poem. My father died. So she went and she wrote a poem. And what she wrote was Squanny Cook Elegies, which was a staggering poem. Remains a beautiful, staggering poem. And what it shows is not this anecdote about pain, but what it shows is the spiritual strength that was there in this woman that is here tonight because there's a triumph here tonight over whatever she's been going through. I told a story, I don't like to give you know, anecdotal things 
about anything. But I thought I would tell you this because I'm very happy to be here tonight to see Melissa. <clears throat> Perhaps it exists on only one horizon, one with windmills and belfries, with questioning cranes, meadows with supple aspens, a temperate zone, equestrian statues and water braiding fountains, and when towns break off and hedges and trees commence, the exuberant country we see from the train with hayricks and duck ponds and ravens on a fence for an alderman's funeral. Deferential rain falls ceremonially on cafes and cobbles. Umbrellas blossom and a decent haze glazes the streets where the cathedral wobbles in its reflection. A drizzle is quiet praise and the unshaven priest in his dry certain protector of Latin and the widowed Cyprus sees how flocks of starlings record the annals that preserve history in its immortal grayness and barges pass in stanzas along canals. This is poetry's weather. This is its true home, not where palms <laughs> applaud themselves <coughs> sorry, and, <coughs> and sails dance in mindless delight and girls race the foam. Thank you. Rosanna Warren teaches comparative literature at BU, and her most recent book of poems is Departure. Thank you, Melissa, for your beautiful work. 4D. The plane wumps down through rain clouds, streaks of creamy light through cumulus, and below, a ruffled scattering, a mattress's innards ripped. Friendship is always travel. How to measure the distance eye to eye or hand to hand as our hands age or shoulder to shoulder as we stand at the sink washing grit from beet greens, our palms magenta, our voices low, steady, exchanging gossip and palaver while water rollicks to a boil in the large, old, dented pot and aromas sharpen. Thyme, onion, oregano, children's voices rise and fall. At the fireplace, the fathers argue about the fire and two families will eddy in rising hunger around the oval table with its blue checked cloth. The plane tears through the lowest cloud bank, and again I am making my way toward you from the far country of my provisional health, toward you in your new estate of illness, your suddenly acquired, costly, irradiated expertise. You have outdistanced me. Melissa Green's first volume of poetry, The Squanicook Eclogues, received the 1989 Norma Farber Award from the Poetry Society of America and the LaVon Younger Poets Prize from the Academy of American Poets. Her new volume, 52, is just out from Aerosmith Press. She is also the author of the memoir, Color is the Suffering of Light, and lives in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Is this where I get my Best Supporting Actress Oscar? <laughs> I 
haven't experienced much joy in my life, but as in other things in this world, you know it when you see it. I feel like this is my wedding, my graduation party, my uh, christening of my first child, and a family reunion. <laughs> where all my favorite aunts and uncles and cousins and great nieces and, and babies I didn't even know were born have all come to some grassy place. And it's made me so very happy. Did they tell you I was going to read for two hours? <laughs> I have so many people to thank, but uh, we might be here forever if I do, so I'll have to thank people privately. But everybody at Aerosmith Press is a genius and a dear friend. And everybody at uh, Agni Review and Rosanna Warren and Meg Tyler and Kat Parnell went crazy <laughs> trying to get this shindig together, and I appreciate it so much. People have often asked me why I haven't written more, and it is a great disappointment in my life that I haven't been able to write more. I've spent a lot of time with a severe mental illness uh, from which I can escape occasionally the clouds will clear on the horizon, and I can dash for the desk. And um, I lived in that state for 20 years, I guess. And then I had an accident with my ankle, which is in a completely different kind of pain. It's uh, surgery and sutures and morphine and IVs and... And something like that really wakes you up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know I wasn't awake, but now I feel as though it's woken me up. So when I got home from the hospital, I started my usual way, writing a poem with a high, dense lyric with lots of adjectives and sparkly bits. So I wrote two and a half lines, and I stopped. And I didn't know why. And then I heard a crack as loud as if someone had snapped a Ticonderoga pencil beside my ear. And I said, I can't write like this anymore. Or at least not only like this. There's a whole lexicon and uh, valence to the world that I didn't know anything about. So each of the poems is the two and a half lines and the two and a half lines, and there's a break in the middle. It's some kind of new form or fungus or something. <laughs> so I, I'll read you a few from, from 52. A salt box in Vermont. Wood stove. Two desks kissing books, the latest in a series of sunset-colored dogs, our tall sons, their stair-step children stamping off snow, the holiday table groaning with our work, vegetables, poetry, merriment. It never happened, the house, the oeuvre, the husband holding me, older. Illness married me first and forever, put me to bed like a bad child. Daily, through rain's quicksilver, I count on an abacus of crows. Invitation. Yesterday I saw Caravaggio's Bacchus, 
his torso of ivory blushing with eros, offering me wine, fruit about to bruise, a wreath of grapes, and maybe laurel. I slap the book shut, trembling. I feel a trace of fingerprints on me still, softer than a brush of wet summer ferns, or mist coming in the window from the sea's rough consecration. My loved ones will leave me. Nothing will go right again. Ephemera. Dolphins fan the selkie's hair. A nightingale's tremolo turns to amber, in which a dragonfly wipes her eye, in which primavera's maidens gamble. Here's how I walk with my cane, on broken concrete, with carious teeth and barking with laughter. Scarified, shrunken, childless, shaking, cruel. Love in an Irish family, orphaned, unmarried, childless, no term for the worst of it, to be blackened by them, losing so the young ones I cuddled and read to, the beaten flesh I kissed, blood's deep music. I am unsistered now, unbrothered. I'll live. You've taken the east and the west from me in the heartbeat between dawn and day, the sun and moon you've also taken, in the breath between dark and dusk, you've taken God from me, if I'm not mistaken. At the steps of the Widener Library, a girl my age laughs nearby, fresh from skiing in Zermatt, casual in her beauty, orthodonture, years of good breeding. Harvard Yard is milling with history, ideas, students garbed in confidence and cashmere. I stand unenrolled, smarts not trumping class, I type at Toyota of Boston to keep my bed in a halfway house for the mentally ill. In my one good dress, I cross this compass rose for the bus, lacerated with light. Animal Kingdom, bird song, antiphonal, shuttles between Temple and Cliff Avenue, blade Titian cocker glosses my fur floor, smoke dark, a cat drizzling this page, another marmalade curled on my lap as I read. I don't sleep at night. I'm nothing. A mossy-lipped granite, abandoned farm well, full of iron icy, deep black well water. Where are the people, Melissa? I don't know. Don't let me leave the earth too soon. A story. Pre-Raphaelite hair, a little black dress and fuck me pumps, my poems drawing 
actors, dancers, painters to my village digs, books, opera tickets, the Met. Someone else is living the life I thought I'd get. When I whistle, a white horse in Central Park lifts its head, wickering. I lie down like Nebuchadnezzar to graze, my lips kissing a subway grate, 200 miles away, years too late, a forelock whisks my cheek. A children's tale, a coffin width my world is, fairy lights, fireflies ease the dark, poetry my oldest friend can only come down so far, the dank makes her cough, the mold ruins her slippers, I've missed years of my life. Sick with the past, delusional, a hologram wandering the streets. I didn't know I'd be so terrified of living. Joy, a thorn in my heart. Fifty two pickup. Chaos tosses my study like a burglar, dervishing our child's game of temper and bicycle cards. A slow motion blizzard of poems buries me entirely whenever I kneel to drink at the heart's shambles. My sister is dying. Run the film backward, please. Helicopter, spool off screen. Paramedics, recase your saws. Uncrumple that fence. There's her hand on Clyde's bridle. Cut here. Chappelle's woman brushing thunderclouds. Ballet lesson. To bend at the bar in a body without bones. I wanted to be Giselle, on point in my feathers, spinning, airborne, swooning into the prince's arms. I vowed to practice my leaps and plies until I could fly. Later, in Florida, a podiatrist put a cast on a stiff infection, and I almost lost my foot. At 53, I have a permanent brace, a cane, and 10 prescriptions. I've failed at everything. The eater of paper, the drinker of ink, with my pen point, I dig up the watermark, a white peony soft on my tongue. In that sweet wafer, I taste a cluster of birches, cherry, oak. I swallow acres of forest, seed pods like limpets at my heart. The nib plunges into the black current, it's unguent on my lips. I suck down the streets of Evangeline, the drowned parishes of Katrina. These lines, an alphabet, drawn from a corpse's single, alchemized hair. An 
enchantments. The Duke de Berry's Book of Hours took me years to read. History brambled itself in my Celtic hair. So much myth turned me caryatid. Who'll tear down this page? Papyrus like a scrim between us. I held myself away from earth too long. Transfixed, I forgot to eat, to sleep. I forgot to let myself be loved. In Florida, did I tell you I sat on my sister's porch in a hammock swing? watching the evening cardinals weave her cherry laurel into a net of ribboned carmen silk, convinced I'd live my life alone. I saw Eros rise over the osiers, fletching an arrow filched from Artemis's quiver and half lifted up, only to meet his barb of laughter. I sit back. First, dusk comes on, then darkness, then the underworld. How much the world weighs. Mahogany, majolica, silver, gold leaf, porcelain, bisque, brass, clawfoot, everything wrapped in newsprint, sheeting, steamer trunks, and soot, all of it suffocatingly meant for me so she need never die. What I want is two white rooms, detachment, light, to give her house away and go, to lift into say music, a single eighth note in an oboe solo, to leave nothing but bird bones and hair in the hairbrush behind. Beyond the gifts of Aphrodite, green as Chloe lying in Horn. I dreamt the earth opened and dark horses climbed for me. I did not know then I had a body or could be loved or would one day welcome the ancient parchment cheek of Hecate. I will always lose months estranged to myself, engaged to death. This is the year my throat's begun to sag, the chin to loosen, the mouth to curve down. Strange, I've never been able to sing more beautifully. I, oh, sorry. Meg insists I read one more poem. Thank God I've got one more. <laughs> this doesn't come from 52. This is a, 
a little bit longer. Waiting for Evie. Across a cream-colored, raw silk sky, the deeply booming fog horn seems to mourn the ending of the day. Ribbons and veils of chiffon blowing through October's bloody leaves, torn from laughing brides whose white limousines have passed, fog streaming in my summer screams like gauze. Beyond the church spires through the dusk, there is an answering trampanile, a lighthouse in Boston Harbor on an island on a rock pile with peeling shakes and geraniums by the door, but without its beams alight. I know all its windows are open, a rag rug, a table thickly painted beside her trundle bed. On it are salt-scented surf-colored sheets hemmed in scallop shells waiting for a woman to come back from the sea. Let me tell you how it happened. She put her palms together to pray, paused, then plunged into the breakers, learning to breathe underwater, though it came hard, her ear turning abalone, the, the depths disheveling her quicksilver nightdress, as she kicked in her diving down and vanishing. She is going to lie on the Atlantic's deepest altar, to be unmade, to be colonized again with microscopic pearls, to be reborn in the beating of the tides, rhythms which will start up her burdened heart when the metamorphosis is over. Moon, keep track of her. Pebbles chatter as the riptide pulls back stones. Gulls on the seawall pacing anxiously and muttering. I'm here until dark fall, dawn, day, as long as it takes pressing my toes in her freezing lethe under foot. Thank you all very much. And I do hope you'll join us for the reception. We have a lot of food and a lot of wine. And I know that Melissa would like to talk to all of you. Okay, see you there. Thank you. <laughs>